Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. Uh, just for fun today, we're going to revisit some of our greatest hits. Uh, Joining me today is uh, J Dr. Jay Richards and John Tamney, both terrific authors, terrific thinkers. And we did some shows last year on the COVID-19 pandemic and also the, the cost, the human cost and economic cost of the lockdowns. Uh, and it, it was interesting to look back as I prepped for the show and see what I said about Jay's show. Uh, I said, it's now October 2020. And it looks like the worst of the virus is long behind us. And yet, we are still in the midst of a pandemic of fear that is far worse than any virus. And it is a crisis that has basically divided the country into two camps, open America up or keep it shut down. Well, it's now, it's now April 2021, and we've added MAC vaccines to the mix, but uh, has anything fundamentally changed? We're going to figure this out with John and, and Jay. Uh, John is uh, the economic guru for Freedom Works, uh, editor of Real Clear Markets, and the author of The End of Work, and They're Both Wrong. Uh, Dr. Jay Richards, Jay Richards, uh, author of, uh, is a professor at Catholic University, a senior fellow at Discovery Institute, the executive editor of The Stream, and the author of more than a dozen books. Now, the proximate reason we're here to talk about this is John's written a book, terrific book called when politicians panicked, and um, it's uh, and they have panicked. Forward by George Gilder, very well received. And Jay has also written another wonderful book called *The Price of Panic* with two co-authors, and gets into the uh, a little more statistical view of this. But they're both great philosophers, and I think we're going to learn about risk and reward and the pan and the pandemic and the lockdowns today. So Jay, John, welcome. Great Thanks to be so. here. Yeah. Uh, I don't know where to start with this one. I, you know what I think would be a great place to start mm -hmm. is, you know, that Jim Jordan had questioned Dr. Oh, yeah. Fauci yes. mm -hmm. uh, at a hearing last week or a couple weeks ago, and I think he asked the right questions. Let me, let's take a look at this and then, and then play jazz from what, uh, yeah, sure. from what he said. When is the time? Well, in your written statement, you say, now is not the time to pull back on masking, physical distancing, and avoiding congregate settings. When is the time? When do Americans get their freedom back? Can you put your microphone on, please? Sorry. When we get the level of infection in this country low enough that it is not a really high threat. What is low enough? Give me a number. What, I mean, uh, we, we've, we had 15 days to slow the spread, turned into one year of lost liberty. What metrics, what measures, what has to happen before yeah. Americans get my, their freedoms back? My message, uh, Congressman Jordan, is to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as we possibly can to get the level of infection in this country low, that it is no longer a threat. That is when. And I believe when that happens, you will see. What determines when? I'm sorry. What? What measure? What, I mean, are, are we just going to continue this forever? Or when, does, when, does, no. when do we get to the point? What measure, what standard, what objective uh, outcome do we have to reach before, before Americans get their liberty and freedoms back? You know, I, you're indicating liberty and freedom. I look at it as a public health measure to prevent people from dying and going to the hospital. You don't think Americans' liberties have been threatened the last year, Dr. Fauci? They've been assaulted. Their liberties have. I don't look at this as a liberty thing, Congressman Jordan. Well, that's I look obvious. At this as a public health thing. But, but, uh, the, I disagree with you, you on that. You think the Constitution completely. is suspended during, a, during a, a, a virus, during a pandemic? It's certainly not. This will end for sure when we get the level of infection very low. It is now at such a high level, there's a threat again of major Dr. surges. Fauci, Dr. Fauci, over the last year, Americans' First Amendment rights have been completely attacked. Jay, you've written the human cost of the emergency response to COVID-19 have vastly outweighed its benefits. I mean, that's the key point. Fauci is continuing to presuppose. Obviously, he still thinks masks used by the general population, really face coverings, uh, make a difference. He clearly seems to think that the lockdowns and the measures 
preventing schools from opening, that all those are sort of important. So of course he says, I'm looking at this not as a, a liberty or freedom issue, but a public health issue. And so uh, he's assuming, though, that the, all these measures actually make a difference. Well, we're a full year into this now. We've got a lot of empirical data. We've got Florida and New York to compare. Um, and so it's not as if uh, we're in a position where we don't really know Florida, lockdowns. Florida, which <laughs> didn't do much of anything no, after I mean, the initial lockdown, has better statistics than New York, which is locked down everything, and Manhattan continues to be boarded up. Yeah, I mean, that, that, the, the, mo the, the most modest way of saying it, the most moderate way of saying it, is that uh, the lockdowns seem to make no difference one way or the other. We've got empirical data on that. Fauci just completely ignores that, and maybe it's because of his incentives that he doesn't want to admit what he's been advising for the last year uh, hasn't worked and was a bad idea, but that's what's so perverse about this interview already here in April 2021 that he, he still uh, thinks that we can just presuppose the effectiveness of these measures. John, you've gone even, I think, a little further. The reaction by politicians to the coronavirus amounts to the biggest 21st century crime against humanity and nothing else comes close. Uh, with, without question. <laughs> When the United States in particular takes a break from reality, the implications are global. Let's never forget that so much GDP around the world is a consequence of what happens here. Remittances from the United States, from workers, from immigrants to the U.S., to the homeland, in the Philippines, El Salvador, all over the world are a consequence of what happens here. So when you shut down the world's most dynamic economy, people around the world starve. And so the number from the New York Times, I took all my data from the Times to check my own passion against these lockdowns, was 285 million around the world rushing toward starvation. Hundreds of millions headed toward poverty as a consequence of these irresponsible decisions. Not to mention the tens of millions of Americans who lost their jobs, the businesses either destroyed or impaired. The list goes on and on and on, all on the supposition that we somehow needed to be forced to avoid sickness and, in rare instances, ho instances, hospitalization. Now, one of the questions I have is just how bad has the virus been? Because if you look at in comparison to the other pandemics mm -hmm. through history, the numbers are not that dramatic. And if you compare it to, say, a really bad flu season, it looks fairly similar. Now, your co-author, yeah. Briggs, Bill Briggs, has done an awful lot of work on yeah. that. How, how, ba how bad has the last year been in terms of... Uh, it's, it's been something like the Hong Kong flu in 1968, not as bad as the Asian flu a decade earlier than that. Most people that lived through that probably don't even remember that there was this major flu season. And that what makes this different is that it is highly preferential in who it harms. So people with comorbidities over the age of 70 are vastly... Uh, at more risk than, say, younger and healthy people, whereas flu, um, it's more or less the same thing. They're both uh, respiratory viruses, but it's a little more uh, indiscriminate in, uh, sort of across the population. That's what Governor DeSantis in Florida figured out within weeks. He said, okay, look, we'll initially do this lockdown for two weeks until I have data. Then he got data from Europe that you realize, okay, demographically, a segment of the population is at fairly high risk. Let's focus all of our effort on that and not destroy the economy and lock kids in their homes unnecessarily. He was one of the only political leaders that did that. He actually pivoted. And now if you, you know, in a recent interview, he admitted, well, at, at the beginning, I didn't have data. So I locked down like everyone else. And as soon as I had data, I responded to it. Well, it's rare a politician admits a mistake. <laughs> and he did make a mistake and he fixed it. He did. Yeah. Just like Cuomo in New York. <laughs> well, I guess the frustration for me is that there was even a need to find data on this. Let's never forget that if something's killing, if it's massively killing people, people are going to take precautions on their own. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget that it was documented once again in the New York Times that the states that locked down last had the quickest response from their people ahead of time, as in they started wearing masks, whether it made sense or not. They started getting hand sanitizer. They stopped going out as much. I want to meet the people who need a law to avoid what might cause them to be sick or die. Mm -hmm. Now, the obvious response from people is that, well, there's a lot of dumb people out there. And as I argue in the book, the dumb people are the most crucial people of all 
when a virus is spreading. You're talking about the people who are running Montgomery County, Maryland? The, no, I'm talking about the people. I'm talking about the young people who go to every bar and party and make out with every girl and guy they, they, they come into contact with. Well, and I'm talking well about, Fauci said it was okay to go to bars yeah. and just have casual sex. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> You need those people. And you, <laughs> you, need, you need people like my science-denying parents out in California who are, my mom's 80, my dad's 77, who continue to live their lives. Because you needed to find out from the people who rejected expert opinion, did that result in some sort of adverse outcome? Mm -hmm. And so you want, it's crucial that when a virus is spreading, that's when you want freedom to be most prevalent because it's the deniers. It's the people who reject expert opinion who are going to produce the most essential information for you. You're watching The Bill Walton Show. I'm here with Jay Richards and John Tamney, and we're talking about the virus and the cost of the lockdowns and uh, where we would go from here. So the, the comorbidities are a very interesting problem in my mind because it's really obvious that everybody over the age of 80 is quite vulnerable, yes. maybe 75. If you've got some other co interrelated, if you're if you're overweight, yeah, overweight, you're obese. Yeah, isn't, isn't I, this like isn't like the 80 percent of the hospitalizations of people who are overweight? I mean, if you if you count uh, obesity, type two diabetes, metabolic diseases in general, uh, plus vitamin D deficiency, I mean, the the overlapping circles on that are very very high. So that even if you're 70 and you're fit you're probably going to be all right. That, that's what's so striking about this. And yet, what did we do? We implemented policies that effectively make those problems much worse. I mean, for vitamin D, unless you're going to supplement constantly, you need to get out in the sun. You need to exercise to avoid obesity and these metabolic diseases. And we implemented policies that made the comorbidities worse. It's just insanity. There's some serious work about vitamin D that if, you're, if your vitamin D levels are fine, you're not that susceptible, or if they're low, you're quite susceptible. That's something we yeah. can do something about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What's funny about this is, of course, we've known that respiratory viruses are seasonal, and so because they're seasonal, the, where you are, the latitude actually makes a big difference. What's interesting now um, is this realization that part of what the difference in latitude may be is not simply that it's colder when it's farther north, of course, in the, in the winter, um, but that you just get a heck of a lot less sun. I think that's a, so one of these kind of interesting insights, I think, that may have emerged from this pandemic is a, a renewed appreciation of the value of vitamin D. So the argument that, that uh, Fauci and Jordan were having, I don't think they went out for a beer afterwards. No. <laughs> uh, it really comes down to do you trust people to take care of themselves or do you want to you think they ought to be given microscopic uh, instructions about every as running every aspect of their lives. So the d debate they're having, the reason I wanted to kick off with it, really is a debate. That we, you know, what do we, how much of our freedom do we trade off for so-called safety? You know, John, I think you make the point pretty well that we've been taking care of ourselves for years, arm's length distance. Uh, if you're sick, you don't mm -hmm. go out. I mean, it's, it's almost like at the beginning of this, we could have done a public service announcement just saying, okay, this is out there. If you're in this risk group, you've got to do this, this, and this. And if you're not, you need to be care of whether you, whether you get symptoms and how you treat people. But let otherwise, let live your life. Mm -hmm. Well, because we knew this, we lived it. I, I, you've met my wife, Kendall. She has not entered a room or a public building as long as I've known her using her hands. <laughs> It's been the shoulder, and, and it's always washing her hands after she touches anything. We know from Donald Trump, historically, yeah. he didn't. If, he, he was like Don't that. shake my yeah. hand. Wait, 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 wait. Americans are by their nature a bit germaphobic as mm -hmm. is. And so the idea that they weren't going to respond to this in some way is the, the idea that there weren't going to be a variety of responses to, to a virus spreading defied basic common sense. Of, of course they were. And so you add in the extra fear which I think speaks to the danger of government being involved, even in warning us about a virus. Once you throw that in, uh, the idea that people weren't going to adjust very quickly defied just, just our, our daily experience. Mm -hmm. uh, we know people who already, pre-virus, just were almost nightmarish to be around because they were so afraid of germs. So, so I said at the outset, this is, we have a view, we're, we're uh, Philosophically aligned, we mm -hmm. think it's less dangerous. We ought to let people live their lives and take, you know, take adjust their risks as a, in, as a, as a community naturally would. Yet there's another side, the left, which absolutely is for the lockdown. They're for masks, and in fact, if you talk about this sort of thing on the internet, YouTube, in fact, 
Yeah. Jay, our, yeah. our show got removed from the internet, from YouTube. For <laughs> we a spent while. some time off. We, we, we've, we've, <laughs> yeah. been, we've been <laughs> censored and will probably be censored here. But there is this incredible divide. And, and John, you had some people say some nice things. Uh, Scott Atlas and uh, Jay uh, Bhattacharya yeah. about your book. And they've both been uh, censored and banned from YouTube. What? what I wish someone would censor me or ban my book. I think it would drive a lot of sales. <laughs> <laughs> so if Amazon feels like doing that, I think I could get some extra publicity about it. But no, again, the idea that people are fearful of this, and, and, and I, but I do think it speaks to the importance of there are statistical arguments, and Jay knows the statistics much better than I do. My one concern about a statistical argument is that it implies that politicians have the right, if something's mm -hmm. threatening enough, to take away our freedom again. And my response is no. You, you have no right to take away our right to work, to operate our yep. business. If something is that threatening, because you know there's going to be another virus, and they'll say, well, you know, this right. time's different. It, it hits young people now. It hits, it hits little babies. We've got to take away freedom. No, no, no. If that, if that is spreading, all force from government would be superfluous. If suddenly you could promise me that if I walk out the door, I'm going to die, well, I don't, <laughs> I don't need to be forced to do that. But again, you want those few people who are going to say, are you kidding me? I'm going to keep going out. Because you want to find out from them if, if what the experts are saying is true. And we, when you have lockdowns, you blind people. It's not mm -hmm. you don't improve health. I really no, feel like you blind I, them. I, I, I think I asked. I think I asked both of you this last time, but I want to ask it again. Is there any evidence? Let me let me rephrase that. Are there any instances of lockdowns like this in in modern history? I mean, this was a hypothesis waiting to be tested. In effect, I mean, but that's what people don't seem to realize is that. The policy for hundreds of years was quarantine. And so you take people that are sick, right, the people that are known to be infectious, and you isolate them, maybe put them together, and then maybe focus on people that you know are really, really high risk. This idea of a population-wide lockdown is something that emerged in the, we'll call it the public health community uh, in the 2000s. This was just sort of the first opportunity that they had to try it. So the very idea that lockdowns would make a difference was purely hypothetical. It's not like we had any data to begin with. And the, the human race was essentially uh, uh, the subjects of this experiment to look at the e efficacies of lockdowns, really government imposed lockdowns, because as John said, and I, I totally agree, we use our local knowledge during the flu season. We, everybody knows when the flu season is. If you know you're susceptible or you, you, know, you know that y your friend is sick, you, you adjust your behavior based on that. Mm -hmm. The assumption was that mandatory government imposed lockdowns were somehow going to well, make Well, and, and throughout history, uh, you know, totalitarian regimes have, have favored experimenting of with course. humanity. And yeah. that's what's been happening. Yeah. What's great about this, though, or great from the perspective of the totalitarian, is that I think the public health argument, it, it adds a new wrinkle. It'd be, it'd be different if we had been told, okay, you can't go to work, you can't go to church, you can't go to your job for your own good. You know, it's like you, we, you need to be protected. But we were told that we needed to do it for the sake of other people. There was a kind of, I've talked about this moral jujitsu in which we thought, okay, I need to curtail my ordinary freedoms for the benefit of the other, other people. And I think for a lot of Americans, it took them months to kind of work their way out of that, that basic argument. Well, let me veer into something that will probably get us in trouble and certainly <laughs> banned. Uh, the origins of the virus, mm -hmm. China, Wuhan. It seems pretty clear now that it did originate in Wuhan. It did mm -hmm. originate in the laboratory. The laboratory had been moved just within the last six months. And when you've been experimenting all these things, the odds of something getting out. Sure are enormous. We know that the Chinese banned flights from Wuhan to, inlet, to other places in China, and yet didn't ban flights to the United States or Switzerland or Italy, where all the places were broke out. So whether or not this was intentional, once it was out there, they certainly didn't do anything to protect the rest of the world from it. And then you take it forward into, uh, into January 2020 to January, February, when it's beginning to break out. Uh, we also have this man who's in office, his name's Donald Trump. He's mm -hmm. president, he's running for re-election in November of 2020, and he's riding high. The economy's doing great, yep. his favorability's up. What do you do if you're on the, on the left and you want to get this guy defeated? What do you do if you're China and you want to get rid of Trump because he's being too tough on China? And we see what's happened with Biden now. I mean, yeah. the Chinese are delighted. Am I just 
gauging into a conspiracy theory, which, uh, which is crazy, or what do, what do you think? You don't have to assume a conspiracy here. All you have to assume is that people on the left can recognize a golden opportunity, okay. right? So yeah, the, the like virus that. accidentally leaks, which is what I think almost certainly happens. Yeah. It accidentally I, I don't leaks think it was in the lab. Purpose. I think it was yeah, like, and yeah. and and lots of people, including you know the entire corporate media, realize this is a terrific opportunity in the United States, at least, to take out Donald Trump. Well, you look at what happened with the 2020 election and all the manipulation that went on with the mail-in ballots mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. That was played right into the hands of, of voter fraud. Um, fraud's really the wrong word. I, I'm of the camp that the Democrats stole the 2020 election. Um, they stole it uh, clean, uh, fair, and, fair and square. <laughs> I mean, they, what they did through 2020 is they changed all the rules mm -hmm. so that when it came down to it, it vastly favored uh, their side, and, and they, quote, won. Yeah, well, a couple things. The first thing, reason I'm a little bit skeptical is why did the rest of the world commit suicide mm -hmm. based on this? Great point. Secondly, if China wanted to commit, commit harm, and I think you're agreeing that if anything is accidental, what a meek virus to send out. Again, as the New York Times kept pointing out, is largely associated in a death sense with nursing homes and with very sick people in them. Thirdly, we knew from China that the virus is many things, none of them lethal. And how we know that is that China is the largest market for GM cars. Uh, there are 4,200 Starbucks in China. It's the second largest market for Nike, for McDonald's. If it had been killing- Four, 400 million consumers. Massively, and they are have, conducting a love affair with all things American. And so if it had been killing indiscriminately, mm -hmm. U.S. stock markets would have crashed in January. They would have crashed probably in December of 2019 mm -hmm. to reflect the decline of a major market. And so I make an, the argument in the book that China was our best evidence that this was many things, not lethal. And I, if I can say about Trump, if he acts like Trump, you know how they always said, let Reagan be Reagan. If Trump acts like Trump and sticks to this is no big deal and says, oh, by the way, any governor who locks his people down mm -hmm. will have me as a regular campaigner in that state. I will make this the issue of the election. He's still president today, no matter the rules that the, the Democrats change to get to get into office. And so to some degree, we have to acknowledge he panicked too he to his own detriment. I quite agree. Uh, you're watching The Bill Walton Show. I'm here with John Tamney and Jay Richards, and we're talking about the origins of the virus and, and how it was handled and uh, whether that was a, a plan or it just was a random outcome of, uh, of the way viruses normally work. John, you make a great point. I think Trump's biggest blunder was getting in front of this virus and acting like a hero. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of a sudden he went from being a bit of a skeptic to then he absorbed the, the Fauci speak, and so this is terrible, got in front of the doctors where they told us terrible things, because the model, the famous model in, from uh, what Imperial University, College, in, Imperial London, College said there were three or four million people who were going to die. It was 2.2 million, and then and Trump told us in April, I think it was April 8th of last year, he said, well, two very smart people came into my office and said, Mr. President, if we don't lock it all down, 2.2 million people are going to die. Well, they, they they didn't get that number from a Ouija board. They got it from <laughs> the, the prediction of this model, which we very quickly knew was not true. And so as John said, <coughs> President Trump's initial instinct, he said, we don't want the cure to be worse than the disease. So that was sort of his initial instinct. But he very quick, quickly was led astray by these public health officials that he had inherited from the permanent state, unfortunately. And he's not president as a result of that. It's hard to ignore how he changed. Again, mm -hmm. he said virus is no big deal. So did Vogue editor Anna Wintour. You had Bill de Blasio in New York so riding around Fauci. on subways. Yeah. Yet Fauci, you had de Blasio, de Blasio saying go to movies. So if Trump stays Trump, now people say, well, People always say, well, he shouldn't have tweeted, he shouldn't have done all that stuff. That was Trump being Trump. In this case, <laughs> if he had just acted like Trump and said, wait, you're going to destroy businesses and jobs, you're going to lock people down as a virus mitigation strategy, I can't think of something more backwards when economic growth had always been the biggest enemy of death and disease. So if he sticks to his natural obstreperous guns, he is still president today. Because again, we knew from China that it was many things not lethal. And let's just the, the let's say that the Imperial College predicts 10 million deaths. Mm -hmm. At what at, at which point force is even more superfluous. Americans were going to lock down on their own based on the prediction. They didn't need government 
getting in the way of the right of free people to figure out individually and as businesses how to deal with this new reality. So, so we're going to maybe there's a, a, a view that we share that, okay, so this was not something that the Chinese unleashed on us to, you know, the plague, at, uh, which, because they knew it wasn't that lethal. And then it came here, and the Democrats seized an opportunity. I mean, that's what I think. This is a seizure of opportunity. And as John said, you still have to account for the fact that most of the world also panicked. Well, you can explain let, domestic let, media. Let, 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 let's talk about that, because they're still locked down. Oh, yeah. And you know, Paris just locked down for another week. Uh, New Zealand, Australia, mm -hmm. um, London, um, Ireland, Scotland. The, the Anglosphere is insane on this, basically. Mm -hmm. Rich yeah. countries. Yeah. Uh, amplify. Why? Uh, to some I mean, what's, degree, what's... you can lock down because you can. Imagine if this virus spreads in the year 2000. Well, mm -hmm. there's no Facebook to, on which to feature your virtue about how you're at home. <laughs> there's no Grubhub and Postmates that you can have the subhumans who don't believe in science to deliver you food. There's mm -hmm. Remember, you know from the investment banking world, Webvan had gone bankrupt in 2001. Grocery delivery via the internet was not a viable business model 20 years ago, so people couldn't have stayed at home and, 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 and protected themselves. There's no Tiger King back then, not yeah. all the streaming of videos so you could sort of comfortably stay at home. Internet was way too slow mm -hmm. for the well-to-do in our midst to basically operate their businesses from elsewhere. The head of investment banking at Goldman Sachs operated investment banking from his house in Hawaii. You couldn't have done that 20 no. years ago because work was a destination. So the rich among us in these well-to-do worlds basically said, well, we can take a break from mm -hmm. reality. Doesn't everyone have jobs like us? It was the ultimate let them keep eat cake moment. It was the, si the sickest sign of decadence. Yeah. And I, I've heard about decadence in America and the developed world for decades. No, this was it, in my mm. opinion. We finally crossed the line of, wow, we can take a total break from reality and stick it to those with the least who have the temerity to have a job they have to go to. Who cares about them? Mm. Yeah. I think that's exactly right. I mean, the reality, I mean, I was in this category. My job was easily digitizable. In fact, I was so frustrated with the lockdowns, I spent the extra time I gained writing a book, complaining <laughs> about, about, the right, about the lockdown. <laughs> right? That's the reality. Gave me all this yeah, stuff. <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, there's lots of jobs that either are already digital or can be easily made digital. But if you're a plumber, if you're a dishwasher in a restaurant, you know, I mean, just go through the list. John is exactly right. Manual labor involves manual labor. And so those kinds of jobs can't be digitizable. And that, that's an absolute uh, ins insight to this. The chattering classes, though, those of us with Twitter accounts, quite frankly, mm -hmm. are able to get on and virtue signal. And then, of course, now, this is really the first major pandemic since we've had smartphones uh, w in which we can get direct video access to panic porn right to our eyeballs, right mm -hmm. to our retinas in real time. I mean, Bill, you and I have talked for years. Uh, probably our most consistent conversation is how in love you've been with your work much of your life, that you were doing something that you could not get enough of. For me, I can't not write. You could offer me tons of money to not do it, and I would have to think about it. My wife might strangle me, but I would have to think, <laughs> what if they took away your ability? She can't ability? do that with her elbows. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. She couldn't. Yeah, and the germ. But what if they took away your ability to do what animates you? It's, it, yeah. Work is more than money. It's for a lot of us, we can't oh, get enough, enough yeah. of it. And we told people that suddenly you're not, you're not essential. Yeah. What you do because you have the temerity to have something that is a destination is so no longer worthy. And here's a check for $1,200 for your troubles. Well, the sickening nature of that. Well, that's the theme. That's one of the themes of the left, though, is, the, is, mm -hmm. the, is that work is a, is a dirty word. And, it, you know, whether it comes from Marxism or whatever, the workers, and you're, you're asked to do these things that are just terrible for you to do, and ignores the fact that we need work. Yeah. And we need to, you know, Freud said, what, we're, love, we have two connections to reality, love and work. Mm -hmm. And you're right, that by declaring a lot of these jobs in, unessential or in, not essential, we basically said to 40, 50 million people, you don't count. Right. It's a perfect example also of the, the fallacy of central planning because, of course, everyone has local knowledge about their own work. I was able to adjust 
based on the details of my knowledge. But the government essentially just decided this class of work is essential, this class of work is inessential, based on what? Mm -hmm. Based on what criteria? Or this, totally department, or this yeah. department in a hardware store That's is right. essential and this one yeah. isn't. It's insane. Yeah, you, you, could, you could go to Walmart and buy clothes, flowers, and furniture, but if you went to a furniture, flower, or clothing store, those were shut down. So the idea was, oh, we want to separate people. Oh, so let's just pick and choose a few businesses that you can all crowd into, <laughs> rather than let businesses that are miracles on their own discover new ways to meet your needs at a time when people were scared. I think they were scared needlessly by bureaucrats who weren't going to lose a paycheck if they were wrong, but that's beside the point. The, even the idea of locking mm. down some and not others basically contradicted the whole point of the lockdowns, which was we want to separate people. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, what, what's frustrating about this, looking back now, I mean, we're a year out. Um, what really should have happened, even for churches and businesses and schools that thought they needed to do something, what should have happened is that every church and every diocese in the country, uh, and every business group should have immediately sued mayors and governors who enforce lockdowns, even if they decided on their own, okay, we're going to implement measures that we think are reasonable. But why is it it was left to one little Baptist church in, in Washington, D.C. to take on the mayor and win? Why didn't every church do that immediately and say, look, actually, it's up to us to decide these things. It's not up to you to tell us when we can gather for worship. What about the measures we've taken? Telling people they can't go out, that's a lockdown. But we've also said you've got to be six feet apart what's that based on? And also you have to be wearing masks. And uh, my pet peeve are the masks that we're being required to wear. And they're, they're, again, it veers mm -hmm. one way if, if you think about freedom and you don't think masks are necessary, so you open up and more and more states are doing that. I think Mississippi just declared yes. that you don't have to wear a mask. Where on the other hand, on the other coast, the left coast, Portland is now talking about <laughs> requiring masks Forever, I mean, what's 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 uh, help me out? Here? Well, I mean, and, and I'm, then I'm also reading things like this: the dangers so the, the, of masks, the, the yeah. dangers <laughs> of masks, and there's a lot of evidence now, particularly for kids, that the fibers in these masks are not great for you. Well, I mean, there's sort of obvious points. I mean, uh, the problem if you imagine you're on the autism spectrum and you're nine years old, right, and so you already have a lot of trouble learning visual cues, and you need extra work to learn the basic visual cues we all take for granted with facial expression, and now you've spent a year, either on Zoom or if in person, in which everyone has almost their entire face covered up. Now, I don't quite know how you measure that, at least short term, but that's a huge cost. Can, no one can really I give you a about. first print personal example? Mm -hmm. I play tennis in Montgomery County, Maryland, <laughs> which is quite a place to be. <laughs> and the, the czar of the, of the medical world in, in Montgomery County has declared that if you're going to play tennis indoors, you must wear a mask. Now think about it. You're on a size of, right. you know, it's like two football fields, whatever, we, and there's almost nobody in there. So I wore a mask because I like tennis. Mm. I was having trouble with my game. We just went outside last week or two weeks ago, and all of a sudden... I was like uh, Roger Federer, <laughs> <laughs> but I was having trouble seeing the ball. Yeah, yep. and I don't—I never really thought of it, but I guess there, oh, that's absolutely. A, I mean, it, there's some so-called science behind. No, that. anyone that knows—I mean, we wear glasses, right? It's so yeah. you have this thing. First of all, you're actually cutting off part of your visual field. You're also yes. probably dealing with the uh, with the fog. I mean, this is these things multiply. Um, like CD guests at you know at an open bar. I mean, it's absolutely insane. Once you start sort of adding up the cost, because I can tell you, Bill, I've probably had 25 people in the last year tell me that masks are a cost-free measure. So even if they don't really work, there are no costs. But it yeah. does it doesn't take a lot of imagination, even without data, to actually realize. Yeah. Well, obviously there's got to be some costs. And it's excessive. Let, let's never forget that it was unnecessary. In Germany. When Merkel was still saying, hey, it's no, the virus is no big deal, hand sanitizer and masks were already selling out. Yep. Again, the science-denying states in the United States, documented fact, those were the people who were adjusting first, getting masks. Mm -hmm. oh, I've got a wife who was fastidiously washing her hands long before the lockdowns. Yep. If I went out, I had to wear a mask just because I <laughs> wanted to keep peace in our time. Uh, people were making these adjustments in the first place. The idea that it, you needed to have this extra level of force defied common sense. But again, it also deprived us 
of the very people who are going to say, you know what, I don't trust the experts. You need the people who question the experts. Yeah. They are the most crucial producers of information of all. Yeah. Uh, you're watching The Bill Walton Show. I'm here with uh, Jay Richards and John Tamney, and we're talking about the, the many aspects of the virus and the lockdowns that uh, are still with us uh, a year and a half into it. So, John, you have freedom in your family. You and your wife have made different choices about handle, how to handle it. Yes. Well, that's a good thing. Uh, so, but what about the social costs of this? I, I was in the gym this morning, and my trainer and I were talking about the fact that all the trainers who used to work for him don't want to come in. Oh, yeah. And he thinks it's having a really corrosive effect on what they're about. And he mm -hmm. says, I, he said, people, this, to your point, John, about work, people need to go to work. Mm -hmm. And they've lost they've lost their livelihood, and they're training people virtually, but yet that's not that's not really what they do. That's not real, and it deprives them of what animates them. There's there's cert, there's a certain thing to being around other people, and we've taken that. And there are so many anecdotal stories, but here in Montgomery County, it was announced, uh, of course, last fall that public schools were going to be canceled, and so my wife's on some local listserv. And the people are commenting, oh, isn't this so great? They're taking such precautions. And so some innocent mother uh, writes in. She says, I've got this autistic daughter yeah. who's never fit in at school before. Well, she'd gotten into the high school band last year, and she finally liked school. And suddenly it was being taken from her. We're hearing about old people who are in old folks' homes a bit senile. Suddenly they can't see anyone. Mm -hmm. And they're asking questions, did I do something wrong? The societal costs of this, what they did in the name of health is so sickening. And then let's talk, about, okay, so my dad had to have hernia surgery. Well, he used to exercise every day at his club. His body withered during this because remember, they're trying yeah. to protect our health. I know someone, a Cato Institute supporter who broke his femur. He had had a personal trainer every day during this. His body just withered away, and so he's now laid up in a cast. The list of what they did in, in the name of our health, personal and physical, is just, it's endless, and it's sickening. Well, just like the masks were not costless, all this other stuff mm -hmm. is not costless. Oh, absolutely. I mean, now notice Fauci in his, his little debate there with Jim Gordon, Jordan, he said, well, I don't sort of see this as a freedom thing. I see it as a public health thing. He was assuming that was the sort of, that was the only trade-off. And this was also the danger is that we were told, <clears throat> the skeptics of us about the lockdowns were told, well, it was a matter of money versus lives. No, the reality is that any policy is going to also have risks. And so you have lives at risk and in danger on both sides. That was always the crucial issue. And so it's not just that the lockdowns didn't work, didn't do what we were told that they would do, but that they ha themselves had profound costs in lies and fortunes. Well, it seems like we've, you mentioned the Anglosphere, but worldwide it seems like we've lost our, our balance in terms of risk and return, risk mm. reward. I mean, there's, you know, it seems like this virus landed on top of a burgeoning snowflake culture <laughs> in America <laughs> where people need safe spaces, and now all of a sudden we have this risk of the virus, and of course everybody goes to the safest, safest, safest possible uh, um, option supposedly safe, yeah. when in fact it really isn't. Mm -hmm. And I, I, was, I was telling you guys this story, you probably already know it, but, and this for me is secondhand, but I was told this yesterday, that there was a professor who asked his classroom the question, let's talk about trade-offs. Mm -hmm. There's this wonderful invention which is going to give you freedom to go wherever you want, it's going to increase productivity, it's going to be dramatically, make the world a dramatically better place. But, it comes at this cost. It's going to cost a thousand lives a week. Would you go for the invention or would you not do it? They all said no. Mm -hmm. Now we have 350 million people living in the United States and what was the invention? The invention was the automobile. The automobile. Yeah. And so we're, we're trading, it's, it's like, the, it's like we're, going to, we're going to turn everything inside out to avoid one life, which is what the politi one, one death, which is what yeah. the politicians were saying to us. Well, and, we're, and notice it's also there's there's an isolation of the problem because of course there's also lives saved by ambulances. So what we're essentially doing is we're counting the costs on one side of the ledger yeah. and ignoring all the costs on the other side. And right. that's that's what we've done over and over and over again, unfortunately. And we're we're also ignoring incentives once again. 
pe- what if they suddenly legalized uh, speeding at any driving at any speed on 495 here? Would you get in your BMW and go drive 160 on on the road if if, if it were legal? No, well, maybe. <laughs> it depend, depends on what time. I need to think about it. <laughs> but you know, the idea that we need to be forced to be careful. Uh, with, we know that there are risks with automobiles. We know that every day. Yet we get into them because again, there there's a risk. There there's a greatness that comes from cars mm-hmm. that. And we just, we take that, we understand, we drive more safely precisely because we know that a failure too could result in death. Well, what was different about this? Why did we need to be forced, locked down against our will, taken our, our businesses and jobs taken away in order to protect ourselves from this? How do we get ourselves out of this? My view is we do not get ourselves out of it until a critical mass of the population simply stops complying. Uh, we have examples now. We have the state of Florida. Um, so, we, so we know, right? It's not like we don't have data on this. We know that opening states up does not lead to some kind of massive uh, increase in deaths or anything like that. Um, but I really, I think so many of us, maybe half the population has so internalized this, internalized the fear, internalized the uh, performative hygiene and the hygiene theater that we just simply are attached to that. We have new neuronal pathways which tell us you need a mask when you're driving in your car to be (laughs) safe, right? And so unless enough people stop doing it, uh, I think that this could go on forever. That's why I think Dr. Anthony Fauci was unwilling to actually specify a number. What's the case count that we're gonna need to get below before we can stop doing this? Because essentially he's voicing the internalization of this, this, uh, this sort of panic, this, this social contagion that I think at least some of the population has internalized. And so I think it's up to the rest of us to, in every way that we feasibly can, quit complying with the really, really mm-hmm. stupid stuff. Well, we've had Don, our friend Don Verdreau here, mm-hmm. and he has written, and I was looking here, I couldn't find it, but I th- he's written that he thinks this pandemic of fear is as real as any other, any other, uh, um, uh, disease. Oh, yeah. And that it's not, we can't just think, okay, well, there's the virus, then your fear, well, that's not real for you. But if it, it is real for so Absolutely. many people, it's a huge popul- huge mm-hmm. percentage of the population. So what do we do with that? How do we, how do we cure that pandemic? Well, I, we may be state by state. By the way, I know you're yeah. a philosophy major. Yes. I, want, I want a big answer. You want we're a big all, answer? We're all counting on it. Yes, inquiring exactly. Minds, inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> the nice well, the nice thing at this about, point, we start speculating. <laughs> yes, exactly. I think that federalism <laughs> serves us well here, so that you have some states that lock down, st- some that don't. Um, I think the word gets out about the free states. I think some people actually move to the free states. And then I think some segments of the population, I'm thinking of the segments of the population that are most harmed by the lockdowns, right, simply stop complying. I mean, at the moment, the reason everyone in my little town that I won't name is still wearing masks is they're, as sort of, they're sort of mostly panicked. Uh, but in some towns, they're just doing it because they think they're supposed to. It's impossible to enforce if an entire town just simultaneously uh, decides that they're going to quit wearing the stupid masks in certain settings, right? I mean, how do you enforce it otherwise? It's, it can only be enforced because for the most part, we are enforcing it on ourselves. But I, I think it's important to stress, and Jay and, and you, Bill would probably agree, we didn't have federalism in this case, and mm-hmm. that's the problem. That's I right. know Florida reacted differently from New York, but if the federal government stays out of it and doesn't sign a $2.9 trillion spending bill a year ago, there's no way California and New York can lock down. There's no mm-hmm. way unless people are being paid to be unemployed or, or the, if, without a cushion that mm-hmm. these lockdowns could have lasted more than a week or two. And so the challenge is getting through this d- despite the fact that the federal government keeps involving itself. But but broadly, I, I'm more optimistic. I point out in the book's final chapter that remember last year in supposedly left-wing California, they said no fireworks shows this year. Well, you don't tell Americans 
that we're taking away your right to celebrate. Right. And th so they ended all the shows, and guess what? The Californians gave them the proverbial middle finger to the politics. There were fireworks shows all over Absolutely. the state. There were videos going around on the Internet that, uh, that the politicians couldn't yeah. control saying, hey, we're going to do this anyway. And in Carlsbad more recently, with the lockdown still in place, the people just said peaceful protest. We're opening up. Mm -hmm. Restaurants, bars packed in Carlsbad, California, saying we can't. We either go out of business or or we or we take our freedom back. And they took it back. Americans are the wrong people to do this to. Um, I hope you're so. right, but I worry about what we talked about earlier: social media censorship. Mm -hmm because they've declared that if you say something that's not in line with what Dr. Fauci is telling us to do, that that's not going to be seen on, uh, on the Internet. I mean, yeah. the, the uh, American Institute for Economic First put out something called the Great Barrington Statement, where yeah. they had a lot of very, I think you oh, were involved yeah. in that. The Great Barrington Declaration, I mean, what's funny about this is that <laughs> it's not just conspiracy theorists, you know, in their basement on YouTube that get pulled. It's professors of epidemiology from places like Stanford Medical School and, and Oxford and Harvard and Yale, right? They, they, these, were the, these were the dissenters dissenting against the government uh, officials uh, that were actually getting censored on social media. It's staggering. Well, I worry it's like climate science, mm -hmm. where oh, you, yeah. if you want to be, you want to have speech and you want to be, you, if you want to be employed as a client scientist, you better come out on the right side of the issue. Mm -hmm. Well, another thing that those two hold in common is that a lot of the panic about climate change and, of course, the panic initially with respect to, to COVID-19 were model-based. They were based upon predictive models, uh -huh. which sound sciencey, but a predictive <laughs> model, unless it's been tested against evidence that it is predicted, is just a complicated argument that's on a computer. It's an argument. It's well, not evidence. Well, you've, I'm, I did a lot of work in statistics, and, you know, we've all built models. <laughs> and it's always sort of, well, we'll assume this, and we'll assume yeah. this, and we'll assume this, and we put it together in an equation, we got an answer. But yeah, the Federal Reserve has got a model. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how many times has the Federal Reserve <laughs> predicted uh, a market crash? Mm -hmm. Or a recession, yeah. or a boom. <laughs> or any, they've just never been right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah so we're we're, we're in, you're watching the Bill Walton show, and we're talking about models, how they're so wonderful in environmental science, and in uh, economic science, and in uh, now I guess COVID science. Mm -hmm. Statistical models, not supermodels. Statistical models. models. Yeah. Okay. Did I, yeah, I just <laughs> no, no. We just don't want to make the ambiguous models. So the fashion models. It's are hard to model. Oh, that's so true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you corrected. Yes, that I don't want to be mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> it's just really hard to model what is human yeah. and what, what what is dynamic. Uh, there have been experts forever. But experts, when they presume to model, that what they're really doing is they're, they're modeling a plan. Mm -hmm. And planning has never worked, and it didn't work here. Any time, and that was what was so frustrating about this, as politicians said, there will be a public health crisis unless we act, unless we take away your freedom. Well, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Once mm -hmm. you take away the rights of 330 million Americans and then hand it to the very few, it doesn't matter... If, if the person's really smart, no. they can never replicate the market. And so as a result, the crises are, always come as a consequence of what mm -hmm. they do, not people living their lives in the, in the way they normally would. And, and we've seen this clearly here. Central planning fails, and it's failed yeah. here. Quick, quick book plug. Price of Panic, When Politicians Panic, I think you both write eloquently and, and persuasively about um, what Jay calls the tyranny of experts. Mm -hmm. And we can't turn our lives over to experts because uh, they don't know. Here we are. Don't yeah. know. Here experts we are. are great so as long as they're talking about their expertise, but you know that narrow expertise by definition is narrow. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And unfortunately, just because you know something about immunology doesn't mean you know anything about the economic consequences of health policy. John. It, it, just because you know a lot about immunology doesn't mean that you can make a statement or a plan based on your knowledge. Right. Central planning always fails. Why do markets work? Because it's the broad knowledge of everyone. It's not that the Soviet Union didn't have experts. It's not that Cuba and North Korea, they've got brilliant people in charge. But you can never substitute the, the knowledge of the few for the broad marketplace, and okay. that is free people. Okay, I want to wrap, wrap up here. Tell us what you would tell the politicians to do. 
I would tell them what they will never do, which is because politicians exist to do something. Don't do anything. Rely on the marketplace that is the people to figure this out. They'll do it much more expertly and much more safely than you could ever imagine. Exactly the same. And I would, again, something politicians, with the exception of Ron DeSantis, would never do, which is admit that lockdowns were a bad idea. Jay, John, John Tamney, Jay Richards, thanks. This has been fun. We'll be back with, uh, with part two, part three, and part four. <laughs> yeah. So uh, mark your calendars. All right. Anyway, thanks for, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And hope you enjoyed the show. And we'll talk with you next time. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Want more? Click the subscribe button or head over to thebillwaltonshow.com to choose from over 100 episodes. You can also learn more about our guest on our Interesting People page. And send us your comments. We read every one, and your thoughts help us guide the show. If it's easier for you to listen, check out our podcast page and subscribe there. In return, we'll keep you informed about what's true, what's right, and what's next. Thanks for joining.